was a part of the earliest known roster of, of this group. And since then, uh, we have been around singing at Villanova in, in the mainline area and touring different places on, on the East Coast and even going internationally with the Villanova Singers. We are an acapella group that is a subset of the Villanova Singers, which is the all-male choir that we'll be performing in a bit. Uh, but I just want to express our gratitude for being at this event. Uh, and we actually have a song to sing for you guys, which we will be doing right now. So hope you guys enjoy. Well, there's a light shining from the window and it shines out on the street. There's a guy standing on the corner singing that good old harmony. As I rise up from the shadows and my voice carries down the street, proud of my life, I'm proud to be part of this good old harmony. I'm singing about soul to soul and brother to brother, yeah, acapella. Well, it sounds good to me. I'm singing about soul to soul and brother to brother. Acapella. Well, it sounds good to me. Well, I just want it understood that the spies drop boogie to the neighborhood. Yeah, we're going to stand under the light and I'm going to sing out to the night. It's just that good old acapella beat. It sounds so sweet. I'm proud of my life and I'm proud to be part of this Old harmony. I'm singing about soul to soul, soul, to soul. and brother to brother. brother, to brother. Yeah, acapella. acapella it sounds. I think I'm singing about soul, soul, soul. and brother to brother. brother. Acapella. acapella. Well, it sounds good to me. I listen. Now when I turn out the lights and say goodbye to another night, I'm gonna rest my weary head and put my bones away to bed. I'm gonna get on my knees and pray to the Lord to give me just one more day. Oh Lord, he my plea, this music means so much to me. I'm talking about soul to soul, and brother to brother. Hey, acapella, it sounds good to me. I'm talking about soul to soul, and brother to brother. Hey, acapella, it sounds good to me. Now that our song is almost done, and it's time we had some fun. Raise your voice, boogie down, and watch the spies break it down. Woo! Thank you guys so much for having us. We are beyond excited to be here and we hope you all enjoy the rest of the event. Have a great day. Everyone. I'd like to welcome you all. I can't remember the last time that I've been at Villanova saw so many baby boomers in one room. It's really great to see and not to be one of the older people in the room for a change. But uh, certainly this is a very, very momentous occasion for Villanova as we welcome back to the Villanova campus uh, Ingrid Croce. Now one of the things that I've learned working here uh, for these last 20 years and being a member of the class in 1974 is a, a little bit about Villanova folklore. And I'd like all the Villanova alumni in the room to please raise their hand. How many alums do we have here? Now I want you to know that every one of these alums who are here today has told me that they lived in Jim Croce's room when they were students <laughs> at Villanova. I'm not sure how that ever happened, but that seems to be part of the Villanova folklore. Um, before we get on to formally welcoming Ingrid. Let me also recognize uh, Father George Riley, 
uh, who is celebrating his 50th year at Villanova University and also happens to be one of those very dapper priests in the photo in the back with Jim Croce. So Father Riley, thank you for being here. And thank you for 50 years of service. Miss Ingrid Croce is an American author, a singer-songwriter, and a restaurateur. And as we all know, Ingrid's late husband, Jim Croce, was a 1965 graduate of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and a member of the Villanova Singers. So it is only fitting to have our current contingent of Villanova Singers under the direction of Tom Evers with an accompanist Chris Kehoe perform for us this afternoon. Gentlemen.
singers will be back with us shortly, but again, as they process off, please another round of applause for these fine young men. <clears throat> I guess Ingrid, as a performer, this is where I should have a couple of jokes to tell while we're waiting for these, these gentlemen to move across there. Again, welcome and good afternoon, everyone. We're delighted to have you all here to, to celebrate this very, very special occasion, something that I know we are very excited about and has been a long time in the making. Uh, Ingrid Croce was born in Philadelphia. She graduated from Nether Providence High School and went on to attend the Rhode Island School of Design and the Moore College of Art here in Philadelphia. Her Villanova connection began in 1964 when she performed as a duo with a young Villanova student from Drexel Hill, Pennsylvania, by the name of Jim Croce. During his years at Villanova, Jim was a member of the Psychology Club, the campus radio station, which was then called WKVU, the Villanova Singers, and as we now know, a founding member of the Spires. Jim and Ingrid would perform at fraternity parties. Yeah, back in the 65, they had fraternity parties at Villanova. Uh, local bars and the course at the famous Main Point in Bryn Mawr. Shortly after their marriage and the subsequent birth of their son, AJ, Jim's first album, You Don't Mess Around With Jim, was released and immediately rocketed to success. Between 1966 and 1973, he released five studio albums, and I was explaining to a couple of these young men what albums were. <laughs> and they said, Mr. Olson, we, we know that. But he released five studio albums and 11 singles. His singles, Bad, Bad, Leroy Brown, and Time in a Bottle were both number one hits on the Billboard Hot 100 charts. And sadly, as we all know, Jim was killed in a plane crash in 1973, just one week before AJ's second birthday. Today, an indomitable spirit and unmatched drive have fueled Ingrid Croce's success in her efforts on behalf of the city of San Diego. A veteran musician and performer, she's no stranger to the spotlight and since moving beyond the stage, her determination and versatility have allowed her to excel in a number of diverse arenas. No challenge is too big and no goal beyond the grasp of this self-made entrepreneur, businesswoman, author, publisher, and philanthropist. When I first met Ingrid about five years ago at her restaurant Croce's in San Diego, she shared with me that over the years she has welcomed many, many Villanovans to the restaurant who just wanted to make a connection to Jim and his music. So as Villanovans Ingrid, we are grateful that you, Jimmy, your husband, and AJ have kept Jim's spirit alive for those of us who grew up with his music, and for future generations of fans, like I know all these gentlemen now are, who will experience the timelessness of his music. And please know that you will always be a part of the Villanova family. 
So it is my distinct pleasure this afternoon to welcome back to the Villanova campus, Ms. Ingrid Croce. Okay, I want to start out by saying that I feel so welcomed here. Before I do anything, all these wonderful people, all these terrific people, the Croches and more Croches, and, and my mom and, and Paul Wilson, and, who is the most amazing photographer, who took all of these wonderful pictures of Jim, and of course my husband, Jimmy Rock, and so many of you that have made me feel just so incredibly comfortable. So thank you so much for coming. It's, it's really... I feel like I'm starting all over again. It's a wonderful, wonderful feeling. Yes. Oops, I spilled water again. <laughs> um, I just want to thank you all so much for making me feel so welcome. I'm going to read a speech, but my favorite part is going to be at the end when I can just allow you to, or ask you to please ask me any questions that you'd like to know about Jim, or <laughs> a little wet up here, any questions you'd like to, to know about Jim, or you could ask also Jimmy Rock any questions if you have any about any further questions about how we wrote the book or anything of that sort. And um, I just hope all of you enjoy this book. It was it was 25 years in the making. It was a long and hard process to do it, but I'm really really thankful. And thanks to Paul for the photos. It's been an absolute labor of love, and um, I'm so glad that we can share it with you. In 1962, I was a sophomore at Girls High School in Philadelphia. In April that year, my mother passed away at just 36 years old from breast cancer. My twin sister Phyllis and I moved from Center City, Philadelphia to live with my father and my stepmother and my sister and brother in the suburbs of Springfield, Pennsylvania, Delaware County. We transferred from Springfield High School and our whole world changed. At 16, I was transforming from a cartwheeling cheerleader into a freewheeling folk singer, learning songs every day. On a late snowy night, two days before Christmas, I was auditioning with my band, The Rum Runners, at the WDAS radio station. I was excited about a hootenanny that was going to take place down at Convention Hall, and Pete Singer and Odette were headlining, and I really, really, really wanted to meet them. That same night, Jim Croce and Tommy Picardo were leaving Villanova radio station after Jim's radio show. They were heading to the WDAS radio station to audition contestants for the Five County Hootenanny that would take place that January. In the parking lot of the radio station, our car got stuck in a snowdrift. And I was with five cadets from Pennsylvania Military College, all part of my, my run runners, who sat in the car while I got out and started to push, because I didn't want to be late. So I got out of the car, and as I was pushing, all of a sudden, I saw this little green Volkswagen come up in front of us. And I looked in the window, and there was this really cute, curly-haired, dark-haired guy with these big brown eyes, and I thought, wow, he's really cute. And then all of a sudden, just spontaneously, I started I started to wave. Well, I was wearing mittens, mittens that my mother had made me with Howdy Doody and, and Clarabelle on them. And all of a sudden, I realized how young I looked. And I put my hands down, and I got all nervous. And then we got out of the snow drift. And, and all of a sudden, we got to the radio station. And when I got inside of the station, all of a sudden, I was sitting there waiting in the green room with all the cadets. And they said that you know these, these two other bands were also trying out. And when I got into the station, all of a sudden I walked into the studio and I could feel like there was somebody watching me. And I looked in through the glass of the studio and I saw the same guy that had been in that little Volkswagen, that little green Volkswagen, driving up, staring, looking back at me. And I, I got really excited about it. So we sang our songs and when we finished, Jim Croce came out to say hello, and he told us proudly that he was a member of the Villanova Spires, and he also told us that we had won the competition, and I was absolutely thrilled. Then walking over to me and tripping over the cord, we both were kind of uncoordinated, um, he asked, have you ever thought about singing rock and roll? 
He also asked if I would sing with him after the show. And I was so excited. I thought he was absolutely adorable. And though I was beaming inside, I kept my cool. And I smiled and I said, I like that. <laughs> For a month, I was counting down the days until the hoot nanny. I was so anxious about the contest and I couldn't wait to see Jim again. I borrowed my friend's white dress with black stripes up the side, long black sle sleeves, and I wore these tall boots so I would look older. I'm wearing these tall boots so I look younger now. <laughs> I wanted to look older, and I wanted to look like Joan Baez. But when Jim came to see me, he told me I looked cute, like a little skunk. And I was absolutely horrified. Recognizing my feelings were heard, he asked if he could play me a song. I nodded yes, and he took my guitar and tuned it. He seemed a bit shy, but at the same time kind of devilish. When he began to sing an old spiritual called Cotton Eye Joe, I was blown away. I'd never heard Jim perform before, but as soon as my guitar was in his hands and he began to sing, he was amazing. His voice was so beautiful and his guitar playing was so excellent, but more than anything, he was so sincere. When he finished the song, he told me he was sorry that he made me sad. And then he asked if he could please see me after the show. The chemistry between us was intense, and I happily agreed. That night on stage, I improvised, and I sang the introduction to a, to a song called The Girl Who Invented Rock and Roll. Now, I have no idea what made me do this. It was an absolutely inappropriate beginning because we were singing the Midnight Special, the banjos were playing, and I said, you heard of instant coffee? You heard of instant tea? Well, you just cast your little old eyes on little old instant me. Well, the audience started to roar. <laughs> I picked up my guitar, I started playing, and I joined in on the chorus. Well, we finished our set, and when the contest was over, we had won first place in the best performance category. Later that night, when Jim came to look me up, after the post-show chaos, I was hugging my father warmly, and my twin sister Phyllis was admiring the Villanova Spires and the cadets. When Jim broke through the crowd and politely asked, could we talk? He led me to a quiet corner. I love your voice, he said. Do you think we could sing together sometime? We exchanged phone numbers and reluctantly said goodnight. When he came over a few weeks later, I opened the door in a tight blue jeans and a baggy University of Pennsylvania sweatshirt. With his 12-string and 6-string guitar in his hands, he was standing at our door in a three-piece suit. He said that he had come from his cousin's wedding. Excuse me, but my papers are now wet, and it's very hard to move. <laughs> Dressed formally in a three-piece suit, a starched blue shirt, and he was apologizing for dressing up so much. And he said that he'd come from his cousin's wedding, which was unconvincing. So we went to our den to study and to practice. And again, the minute Jim had this guitar in his hand, his whole presence changed. He was so confident. I couldn't wait to sing with him. Jim taught me the harmony to Woody Guthrie's Green Pastures of Plenty. I turned on my father's woolen sack to record. And though I had never had a singing lesson before, I was thrilled by how comfortable he made me feel. Just sing this melody, he told me. I hope you guys can appreciate this because I did not know harmony. And he said, just sing this melody. And I learned every note, easily. And then he sang the real melody. And we then were harmonizing. And I was so excited. I couldn't believe that I'd learned this. And we practiced for a couple of hours. And then it was time to say goodbye. And he left and asked if he could please come over very soon. Like many good Italian sons, Jim and his brother Rich lived at home with his parents in Drexel Hill. Jim was the first in the Croce family to graduate from college, or even attend college. And as the eldest son of the eldest son in a tight-knit, very close Italian family, he was, they were involved in his character development. They wanted Jim to pursue a solid career. They couldn't understand why in the world he was majoring in psychology, minoring in German, and certainly they never wanted him to become a singer. The Croces were terrifically generous people. They kindly welcomed out-of-town Villanova students to their home, shared delicious home-cooked meals that none of Jim's classmates ever turned down. Excuse me. Ever. 
turned down. After the two of us practiced almost every day after school for about a month, Jim called and asked me if my father would allow me to come and sing at Villanova. My dad and Jim hit it off immediately, and my father said I could come, but I had to get home by my 10 o'clock curfew. It was at the pie shop here in Villanova that we did our very first concert. That was really exciting. And I remember there was a young man named Joe Salviola who was playing that night, and he had forgotten the words to a song called Just a Little Rain. And he sang the entire song, but with only just a little rain. And he went through the entire thing from beginning to end. It was probably, I was, we were all on the floor laughing so hard we couldn't believe it. But Jim met so many wonderful Villanova friends. There was Tommy Picardo and Mike DiBenedetto, Carl Fehrenbach, and then, of course, Joe Salviolo, his closest friends, who later introduced us to the extraordinary musician and our dear, dear friend, Mari Muleisen, and Jim's, Jim's accompanist, and Jim was his accompanist. They were great, great friends. On my first date with Jim, he took me to sing at a party at Joe Salviolo's house. This is where I first met the Haveners, a group of girls that Jim had taken under his wing. He was coaching them and teaching them harmonies, new songs, and he even helped them to pick out their name and their outfits. When they first met me, they were kind of protective of Jim and cautious about who this young girl was. But after we sang together, they were pretty happy with me, and I guess they just accepted me. From the moment Jim and I fell in love, good food, friends, art, and music graced every facet and nearly every moment of our lives. We married in 1966, and after I attended RISD and Moore College of Art, we moved to New York City. In 1968, we signed contracts and made an album on Capitol Records called Jim and Ingrid Croce. Through the folk movement of the 60s, we wrote our own music and toured, playing for our suppers on the college concert circuit and at small clubs across the country. When our album failed to get public acclaim, we left New York City and moved to Lindell, Pennsylvania. We rented an apartment in an old farmhouse for $100 a month. Can you do that now? <laughs> and all the flowers, fruit, and vegetables we could, was ours. Jim worked construction and drove a 10-wheeler while I sold my art and planted our garden. We played at night at the Main Point, the Gilded Cage, and the Old Riddle Paddock in Lima, Pennsylvania, mushroom capital of the world. Our contemporaries, Arlo Guthrie, Bonnie Raitt, Villanova alumni, Don McLean, and Tim Hauser from the Manhattan Transfer, all used to come to our house for dinner to play music. This was truly the original Croce's restaurant, and I had absolutely no idea back then what this would lead me to. When we found out we were going to have a baby, Jim was nervous. He was even more serious about making music than ever. He wrote Time in a Bottle that night, and the same week he penned You Don't Mess Around with Jim in more than half the songs for his first album. He sent a cassette of his new songs to his friend and producer, Tommy West, in New York City in hope that he could get a record deal. He did, but two short years later, after Jim Croce's songs topped the charts, his plane crashed in Natchitoches, Louisiana. When Jim died on September 20th, 1973, at only 30 years old, AJ was a week away from celebrating his second birthday. He never got to know his dad, but Jim's music played on, and the words to his song, Time in a Bottle, there never seems to be enough time to do the things you want to do once you find them, had more meaning than ever. After Jim's passing, I had no idea how we were going to make it. I kept trying to clarify and redefine my personal vision for family, career, and a home, and followed many circuitous routes. We were still living on $200 a week for our songwriting, and it was hard to keep it together and pay the bills. Then when our son Adrian James was almost four, he suffered a brain tumor syndrome. His bravery was my inspiration, because he went blind. He gave me the courage to fight a long and difficult litigation to attain the rights for the Croce estate. Over several years following his illness, miraculously, by the time he was 10, A.G. gained sight in his right eye, his left eye. While I was busy as a single mom, doing my best to raise our son alone, A.J. taught himself to play piano. He would practice, I never had to tell him, 10 to 12 hours a day, and write his own music. 
He honed his talent, finding his passion and profession early in life. Once litigation was over, I was on the road promoting my own album that was done with the Rod Stewart Group. And in 1984, after a failed vocal cord operation, I could never sing again. Without music, I was totally lost. Once again, I had no idea what I was going to do. Financially and spiritually, I needed a job with good people and a worthwhile, fun place to go, grow. One night, I invited a friend to come over and help me to write a resume. I made her some blintzes. After taking one bite, she insisted she knew just exactly what I should do. I needed to open a restaurant. I wasn't convinced, but the next day I got a business license, signed a lease, and opened my first location. I learned about the hospitality industry hands-on, and when my month-to-month -month lease was up, I got a call from a friend who suggested that I look at a space for rent in the gas lamp downtown. Now, I hadn't been to the gas lamp downtown San Diego since 1973, when Jim Croce and I spent our last night together there. We had walked down Broadway, heading south to the gas lamp, looking for a good place to eat and listen to live music. Disappointingly, there was absolutely no place to go. So we stopped on the corner of 5th and F in front of the Keating Building and joked about opening Croce's Restaurant and Bar to offer great food and live music and to bring a little bit of Philadelphia to Southern California. Less than a week later, after playing a concert in Natchitoches, Louisiana, that dream was gone. But when my friend had suggested that I come downtown to see an open storefront for rent, and it turned out to be the very same corner where Jim and I had stopped on our last night together, I felt it was an omen. I opened Croce's Restaurant and Jazz Bar at the Keating Building, right on that spot. I just knew it was the right thing to do. Two years later, shortly after our house burned to the ground on St. Patrick's Day, I met an attorney musician, Jimmy Rock, on Table 21. He was assisting one of my employees to get out of jail, and I felt comfortable with him right away. <laughs> Even though he was a musician and an attorney, strike two. He threw me a curveball, and we fell in love. We married that Thanksgiving, 1988, and together we expanded Croce's, the jazz bar, to include two restaurants, two bars, and catering venues. We also began to write the biography of Jim Croce together. Jimmy realized through the interviews that we did that there were many people, including myself, who had holes in their heart, and he wanted to help. Keeping Jim's music and memory alive was very important to him, too. So after four years of interviewing family, friends, and fans, when the publisher decided he wanted a more fictional book based on the characters in Jim's songs, we gave him back the advance. We were determined to write the love story behind the songs, and we knew that someday we'd do it. At Croce's, thousands of fans come to visit us every year. Every year we get at least one Leroy Brown who says he's the real deal. <laughs> but I have to tell you that besides all the folks that got to meet Jim on the road, and many of those who just wished that they did, there have been more Villanova students and alumni that have come to tell me how much Jim Croce's music means to them. I can only imagine how happy that would make Jim. When I grew up in Philadelphia, people were as passionate about Sinatra and Linguini as they were about politics and religion. Our apartment across from the Rittenhouse Square was near Philadelphia Art Museum, the Liberty Bell, Symphony Hall, lots of restaurants, the Latin Casino, the Gilded Cage, and of course, Dick Clark's Bandstand. The excitement of the city, its people, the food, music were my inspiration. Philadelphia moved me, and it motivated me to pioneer the growth of San Diego's downtown community, especially the old gas lamp quarter. But when I met Jim Croce, his family and his friends were the center of his universe, and it was Villanova that really expanded it. His teachers, his friends, and his music gave him great confidence. He could do what he needed to do. And I truly believe that Villanova changed Jim's life profoundly. Today, I am so grateful to be here with all of you. And I'm so glad that we are selling and offering I Got a Name, the Jim Croce, after all this time, 25 years in the making. 
When Jim Croce and I met in the early 60s, it was music that brought us together. And it was music, the music business that not only tested our relationship, it constantly challenged our survival. Although Jim Croce was a very private man, we all feel that we knew him through his songs. His voice, his stories, his humor, his sincerity touch us in a way that make us feel that we know him, that he's our friend. And yet, the story that I tell in this memoir about the life behind the songs reveals something closer to the Jim Croce that I knew. For many years, I felt compelled to write about my life with Jim, but I was reluctant. I really didn't know if I should do it and whether I should allow myself the freedom to tell this story. Well, I've done it, and with the help of, of Jimmy Rock, my husband, and I could not have done it without him. It took, taking, it took a lot of distance to get this story told, and I think that the fact that we waited so many years was really an important factor in making sure that we could tell the story right. I want to thank Gary Olson, Jennifer Gallaty, Paul Wilson, my mom, and all the Croches for coming today. It's just been an extraordinary experience to be here with you, and thank you so much. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Yes, well, that's a good question. He is still performing. He's still writing and singing and playing every day. He plays piano, as you probably know, he started out on piano, but now he's playing guitar almost as good as Jim. Um, he's really, a, he's good, and he sings Jim better than anybody sings Jim, so that's a real treat to hear him do that. But um, for all the singers that are here today, and many of you who have been in in the, into music, you know that the music industry is a hard industry. And it's been hard for everyone, including AJ. So he's done his own music, and he writes his own songs. He has, he's doing his ninth CD uh, right now. And he enjoys music more than ever. I think that that's the most important thing about it, is that music brings us so much joy. So the answer is yes, he's been successful, and he's, he doesn't do anything but play music. So that's his profession. There's got to be more questions. Yes. Hi, um, I, I think I, I heard you say that you, uh, Jim, wrote "Time in a Bottle" the, the night that he found out that you would have, be having AJ. Can you tell us a bit about the, the meaning and the origin behind behind the lyrics of that song? You know, when Jim wrote, first of all, one of the things that you need to know when you write songs is you really need, if you really want to connect with people, I think one of the most important things is to be a good listener and a good student. And Jim was an excellent student. He studied history, and he really understood music. He was like a musicologist, you know. And when he sat down to wrote, write that song, plus he was really brilliant <laughs> and talented, but, but when he sat down to write that song, I don't know exactly what happened, but he knew that this was his last chance to make music. Because if he hadn't done it before our son was born, there wasn't a good chance that he'd get a chance to do it afterwards. He needed to, to make a living. So when he sat down at the kitchen table to write that song, I think all the forces came together. His, his knowledge of, of music, his, his understanding of haiku poetry, uh, the way in which he wrote this song was so eternal, really eternal, I think. And I think that this song will be a, around certainly longer than I will, and certainly longer than he was. Um, it's one of my favorite songs, and um, I know that it, a lot of people play it at, at weddings and, you know, for all kinds of occasions. So um, that's, that's as best I can tell you. I, I think that, you know, Jim's songs, sometimes they took a long time to write. Like, there's one, one part of a DVD that we have that, uh, where Jim was talking about writing a song. Uh, I believe it was Roller Derby King, Queen. And um, he said it, it took, had taken him a very long time to write it because, well, first of all, he was scared of the woman's husband who was uh, a policeman. And he was afraid that he might shoot him. And so he didn't want to write the 
song for that reason. But but also, um, he he also wrote songs. Sometimes he'd sit down, and of course the tape recorders were always going, and um, he'd sit down and write a song in a, you know 15 minutes. Sometimes we'd write songs together. So it was. It was very different for each song, but that song really came pretty quickly, overnight. Yes? Uh, going off of your last point, I've always been curious, um, like you said, when he performs, he's, all, he's just so genuine, sincere, you never know if this is a story he's telling or something that he went through. I was wondering the song Operator, uh, if you knew the story behind that. Sure, that's a, that's a good question, because that's a composite song. Um, let me get a little bit closer, see if I can. Um, that's a composite song. Uh, the first time that that song began, really, in, in the original form, was down at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Uh, there were people, you know, I don't know if you know what a phone booth is, but, <laughs> but we used to have phone booths that were stuck to the side of buildings, and uh, this particular phone booth uh, was at the barracks, and all these guys were lining up to be able to talk to their sweethearts. And he was standing in line in the rain with, with a raincoat over his head, and he was listening to every one of the soldiers as they were telling, as they were talking to their girlfriends on the phone. And so that was the beginning of it, because he was hearing these Dear John stories, you know, the people would leave the phone crying, and he was like, you know, it was just really, really sad. So then, he used to play at this place, that, in fact, we used to play at this place called the Riddle Paddock. And the Riddle Paddock had a phone that was right behind the paddock itself. Out in front, we would, Jim would sing out in front, and right behind was the payphone. So the phone would ring while you were singing. And it, was, it was not the kind of place that was quiet. You would just, you know, it was really rowdy, really rowdy. And so he also was hearing these stories on the phone that was behind the, um, the stage at the Riddle Paddock. And when he wrote, wrote the song, Operator, it also had some, some connection to real life, but it was mostly really this, these stories that he had in his head. And, and you're right on when you say, you can't, he was so sincere. You can't really, as you know, really and truly, I couldn't tell the difference either. I mean, you could, you could never tell the difference between fact and fiction. And you didn't really need to, because it was kind of a metaphor. You know, all of the things that he did were kind of a metaphor for life. It, it, was, it was all good. Any other questions? Yes. Pink. He didn't live in a dorm, but he, I, I guess somebody was asking me about a certain dorm that he used to go to all the time. I know it wasn't the girls' dorm. <laughs> um, but no, I think he did go to the girls' dorms. But, but I think that, um, but I do think that he, um, he used to come to the school a lot. And like I said, a lot of the students, the Villanova students, used to come over and eat at Jim's house. Jim's mom was an amazing cook. And we used to eat over there a lot. And uh, no one ever refused an invitation. So he lived at his own home. He never lived in a dorm. Yes. Yes. All right, there are three different questions, and I'll answer them all in order if I can. First, first question, um, I don't really like to cook. I love to eat. <laughs> and I love to eat a certain kind of food, and I was the only one who could make what I really wanted to eat, which is why I got into cooking. Because I just, I like, I'm so particular about how I want food to taste. There was no one else who could make it but me. I, I'm, I'm an artist at heart. And, that's what I'm actually going back to doing now. And it's really important to me to do things a certain way. So I really learned to cook so that I could eat. In answer to your question about Jim's mom, Jim was an excellent cook. And he used to make me dinner every single night. I'd come home from Moore College of Art, and he would prepare wonderful meals for us. And then he'd have used every single dish and pan in the entire kitchen which I had to clean up before we'd go to the Riddle Paddock to play. So well, I had to learn how to cook so all the pots and pans weren't being used, and I did that. And I had him teach me his recipes. So I learned how to stuff squash blossoms, and I learned how to make 
uh, all, you know, veal piccata and all of the Italian recipes, and, and I still do those to, to, till this day, make them for our family. And finally, the last question that you asked. Did he appreciate your artistic ability? Yes, he, he actually, before my, my father died when I was 19, and one of the things my father had asked of Jim was that he keep me in school. And um, it was interesting because Jim really loved my artwork. And he used to do artwork. He used to do these, these little leather pouches. Excuse me. And some of them were really big pouches, you know, big, big purses. We did a lot of different things just to make, make ends meet. And um, he used to make these things called little uglies, which I was going to wear one today because they're really cool. This was a beautiful purse that he made me, and it's all made out of leather and very rustic, you know, but really, really wonderful. And we both appreciated each other's talents and abilities. And it, I think that was, you know, that's to me the most important thing in any relationship is to enhance what a person can do, to keep, to keep helping them to grow and enhancing it. And Jim did that for me for a very, very long time. So in answer to your question, yes, he did appreciate it. Yes? Oh, that's a good one, Cobra. Um, well, the song that's my favorite, there's three answers. Um, my favorite song that he wrote is Time in a Bottle, Operator. I'll Have to Say I Love You in a Song. Um, oh gosh, I can't pick one. But my favorite song that he sang is I Got a Name. Because um, when he did I Got a Name, Jim, as I mentioned in, in my, my little speech, that Jim used to always have a guitar, like a bar between himself and the bartender. And that space between him and the other person was really important. So he wasn't, um, he was, there was some distance between him. And he really didn't get that close. He, he really was close as a human being, but he physically, and emotionally was more of a listener. He was quiet and kind of shy, unless he had a guitar in his hand. So when he sang, I Got a Name, he, they had him do it without a guitar. And I can hear the vulnerability in his voice, and it's, it touches me. I can't, I can't barely listen to that song without feeling, feeling really sad. On the other hand, all of Jim's songs make me feel really happy. So um, I just, I love all of his songs. I can't really say that there's one. And as far as the songs that we wrote together, um, oh, geez, you know, I think, I think I really like the harmony on the song Can't Wait. Um, I don't know if you know that song, but if you don't, I'm, we're gonna be putting an album together, in fact, very, very soon, to be an accompaniment to the book um, of our songs together. So at some point, you may see that on our website, which by the way, I've got to be honest, I left all of my, my information that I wanted to give to all of you. Uh, if you have pens and paper, take them out now. <laughs> but I left everything back at the hotel room and I can bring them out perhaps to Villanova and give them to someone so they can hand them to you if you live nearby. Or you can just go to crochies.com and pretty easy, crochies.com and you can write to me because um, if, you, if you're interested in you know, being part of Crochies or coming to visit us someday, please do that. You can, you can just write to us from crochies.com and we'll definitely get back to you. I, I answer a lot of letters every single day and believe me, they still are coming in, especially now with a new book out. Yes? Yeah, he, in fact, there's a, there's a sergeant here somewhere. He, no, no. <laughs> there's a sergeant here somewhere um, that came up to me. Oh, there he is. Anyway, can you remember what year that Jim was in? He was in the Army National Guard. Yeah, Army National Guard. In Media, Pennsylvania, yes. And it was in, we got married in 1966. And the week after we got married, 
he went into basic training. So 1966 to 67, somewhere around there, that he did basic training twice. He was, he was a disciplinary problem. <laughs> If you can imagine. Uh, yes. Well, he did it in two places. First, he did it in South Carolina, uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and uh, then he moved up to Fort Dix. Yes. 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 Oh, well, he ever vision completely to be able to read sheet music? Well, he drives. Okay. okay. So, um, and he knows he can read sheet, sheet music. But when he was only four, he, when he went blind, uh, he used to listen to Stevie Wonder and to a lot of the blind musicians. And he really felt their music. And that's why he started on piano. He just felt their music. And he could play right away. I mean, it was, he was just a natural, really. And he, started, he wrote his first songs when he turned six. So he really was a natural. He's a, he's a terrific singer-songwriter. And if you haven't heard him, I'd love you to listen, because he's, he's different than his dad, but he's, he's really good at what he does. He's all over YouTube. He's all over YouTube, yes. You can listen to him anywhere. And also iTunes. Yes. You know, I think that I'm pretty sure that, if I'm not mistaken, there is the Villanova Singers. I think I have an album of Jim in the Villanova Singers at home. So there must have been a recording. Well, I meant commercially. Commercially, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. But I think it was just through Villanova that they did do a recording. You have that, okay. I think I have that too. You know, the first album that Jim recorded was called Facets. And um, it was done when Jim's father, who really did not want him to become a musician, um, decided that for a wedding gift, he was going to give Jim the opportunity to make an album so he'd never want to make one again. <laughs> Which is kind of funny. Uh, but he... Um, so he had this, he made this album, which is a fabulous album. We've put it out, you can get it on, on, on our website, uh, called Facets. And, and he did a lot of folk songs back then, you know, Buffy St. Marie and, uh, gosh, you know, uh, Bessie Smith and um, just a lot of songs that maybe some of you would might maybe want to pick up, I don't know, maybe even some of Jim's songs. But he did a lot of songs uh, back then on this album that's really a classic. And then we also have another CD um, of Jim just singing in the living room. It's just called Americana, and it's a really, I think it's a terrific album. He's doing a lot of kind of country, rhythm and blues kind of sound, and it's a great, great album. Yes? Was Jim a true cigar? <laughs> no. Was it props? It was props. props. I mean, he'd smoke a cigarillo once in a while. In fact, I had to call Paul. I had to call Paul to ask him about it. You know, honestly, my dad used to smoke a pipe. In fact, I have my dad's pipe. And I love the smell of tobacco. So I was never a problem, but he used to, he never smoked them at home. Let me put it that way. That was a problem. It was a problem. Yeah. Okay. And the picture you see on that album over there That's is an outhouse. Getting. That's the outhouse. That's the outhouse. Behind our house. He, one other question I had. My dad, I remember being a little baby, my father did the first Jim Coachy album, him explaining me how we were related. And I remember him showing me um, the window that Jim Coachy was in. It was arched. That's I always promise myself someday when I'm at home, I'm going to get those same art boards in my home. Where was that taken? That was taken in Lindell, Pennsylvania, at the outhouse behind our house. <laughs> <laughs> it is still there today. And so is the place where we lived. A lot of people write me from that house all the time. They move into the place where we lived, and they write to me, and they tell me, we're now living. So I always know there's a new person there. They always write to me and tell me, we're now living at this place, and we just wanted to let you know we're the new neighbors. OK, well, thank you so much for coming. Last question, Villanova. Villanova, last question. Well, 
that's an interesting thing. You know, he was down south when he was down in Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And um, that's where he got it from. I mean, Jim was truly, he could, he could imitate anybody. And he had a great way of picking up accents and, you know, whether it was British or Southern, you know, he could do it. And um, so that's where he got it from. Thank you so much. I'm going to go sign some books. One of the organizations that has helped keep the, uh, the great tradition of the Villanova Singers alive is our uh, Singers Legacy Alumni Organization, and they were very much a part of helping to put together today. So I'd like to call on Jim Anderson, who's the president, uh, to tell you a little bit about the organization, and he also has some special presentations. Jim? Thank you, Gary. Um, I just want to say how thrilled and honored we are to be here this evening uh, to celebrate one of Villanova's most cherished and notable alumni, Jim Croce. Uh, I'd like to personally uh, welcome Ingrid back to campus. Uh, campus has definitely changed a lot since Jim start, uh, graduated in 1965. Um, but there's been one constant over those years, and that's been the Villanova Singers. Um, I've been asked to give a little background on the Singers and uh, our Legacy Society. Uh, back in 1953, Harold Ruschlein, then the Dean of the Law School, was asked to establish a group for the purpose of singing all types of music and enriching the cultural life of, and community of Villanova. The one request that the Dean had was that the new group not be called a glee club. He, so thus the name Villanova Singers came about. So we've never had a Villanova glee club, men's glee club here. Uh, Dean Ruschlein uh, began a tradition of brotherhood, brotherhood in song, which has grown over the years to make the singers one of the strongest, most active, and most successful student-run group on campus. The singers are the oldest vocal group on campus. Dean Ruschlein was quoted as saying that he was as proud of the Villanova singers as he was at establishing the Villanova Law School. He also went on to say, I think that I have a bit I th have things a little bit out of focus, but music is my primary recreational interest, and I think the, th the singers are a great thing for this campus. I think that Dean Ruschlein would be extremely proud of how the singers have continued this tradition that he established some 59 years ago. In 1963, the singers expanded their concert schedule to include an extended tour of the Midwest. They have performed in Chicago, California, Florida, and at numerous colleges up and down the East Coast. Since they started touring, the singers have also traveled approximately 200,000 miles as ambassadors for Villanova University. Their first overseas tour occurred in 1980 with a trip to Poland. Since then, the singers have traveled to Brazil, Italy, Switzerland, Germany, Spain, and Puerto Rico. They are now in the process of organizing their spring tour to Costa Rica with the Villanova Voices and the Villanova Gospel Ensemble. Over the years, the singers have had the opportunity to sing at many locations, including St. Patrick's Cathedral, the National Shrine in Washington, D.C., uh, West Point's Cadet Chapel, and Old North Church, just to name a few of the places they've sung. The singers have appeared on TV numerous times. They also had the pleasure of performing with world-renowned soprano Eileen Farrell in 1968. The singers have also maintained a local presence over the years. They participate in an annual St. Thomas of Villanova Day of Service by performing at retirement homes in the Philadelphia area. They've also sung for the annual Special Olympics event at Villanova, and for the second year in a row, they've been asked to sing at the Bryn Mawr Fire Company's 9-11 memorial service. The singers perform regularly on, camp at, at, on campus events, including the annual Christmas and spring concerts with the Villanova Voices. The singers have come a long way since Dean Ruschlein established the group. The one thing that has remained constant is brotherhood and song. In my opinion, the singers are the best fraternity on campus. As you heard a little while ago when the singers processed in, they sang the singer's anthem, which is Brothers Sing On. The brotherhood has continued to thrive over seven decades and will continue for years to come. We're we are very privileged to have only the seventh director of the Villanova Singers 
history here today, Mr. Tim Evers. Uh, Tim was formerly the singer's accompanist and is an extremely talented musician and director, and we're sure he'll carry on all of the traditions of the singers as they continue to strive for music excellence. As Gary mentioned earlier in, my, in the introduction, I'm the president of the Villanova Singers Legacy S Society. Uh, I'd like to give you just a little bit of background on the Legacy Society. Um, we have one of our alumni is Billy Polito. He's class of 1972. And for 30 something years, he's had an annual July Fools party where he invites his friends and he invites most of his fool friends, the singers. Um, and over the years, they've had many discussions and they've talked about what can we do to help the singers? What can we do to keep these traditions alive and well? So in 2006, for his July Fool's party, he invited the current singers president and their alumni director. And we, they, they hashed out everything and they said, we're gonna have a reunion in 2007. Well, 2007 came along, we had our reunion over at the Villanova Conference Center. Villanova Conference Center has a room ooh, probably a little smaller than this. We were bursting at the seams, absolutely bursting at the seams. And so our one concern the first year was, how is everyone going to get along? We had kids as young as age 18 up to uh, adults in their, in their 70s. They could be some of these kids' grandfathers. Well, it took a grand total of maybe 10 seconds to get, to get along. Everyone was swapping war stories, singing, you name it. It was just an unbelievable event. So then, of course, everyone said, oh, we had such a successful event. Let's do another one. So we said, let's keep the momentum going. And in 2008, we had our second one right in this very room. We probably had, I think, maybe 250 people or so, 200, 250 people of all ages. And it was just phenomenal. We end up, we end up with a, a mass on Sunday. And you probably, it's probably the best singing you've ever heard in your entire life at mass. Everybody in the, in the pews are singing. Uh, and since then, we've had two more reunions. We had one in 2010, and we just had one this past year in 2012. So from that, that respect, we were doing fabulous things. But we wanted to do more. So what we decided to do was we had talked back in 2007 about establishing a foundation to help the singers, okay? The singers, one of their most important and vital things that the singers have done is touring, okay? And we wanted to help maintain that touring for the singers. So we set up an, set up an endowment fund for the singers. And as of roughly today, we've had 250 people contribute, and we have approximately $240,000 in that, that foundation. So we, in this endowment, in 2010, the endowment had a fully funded tour for the guys to go, go up to Boston, sing up in Boston. In 2011, they did a tour down to Washington, D.C. And now in 2012, Next month, hopefully, guys, where uh, you guys are going out to Pittsburgh to sing. And this is all fully funded by uh, the Villanova Singers Endowment Fund. And the good thing about this endowment fund, like any other endowment fund, it just goes on and on and on. Okay, and we can have at least one tour per year for the singers forever. And uh, you know, we, we keep getting money in from uh, from very generous people. Uh, and you know we're always looking for, for more, more funds for the endowment fund, and it'll keep these guys on the road, and you know you can go on to, to bigger and better things. So if anybody is ever interested in talking about the endowment fund, uh, endowment fund chairman Joe Beebe is here. Uh, if you wanted to talk to him, Joe, if you could just give a wave, okay? Um, uh, this afternoon, we're here to pay, pay tribute to one of the greatest Villanova singers ever, Jim Croce. Like many of you guys in the group today, Jim loved to sing and was extremely talented. In 1961, Jim joined the Villanova Singers and later joined a new folk group, which is a subset of the singers called the Spires. That's when they use guitars. Uh, the Spires performed at many on-campus events and coffee houses around the Philadelphia area. Jim was also the first musical director of a smaller group of Villanova nursing students called the Haveners. The Haveners are still performing today, and they're a smaller group of the Villanova Voices, which was formerly called the Villanova Women's Glee Club. 
as well, the Spires are still alive and well, as you saw here earlier today, performing. Over the years, the singers have had many talented men pass through their ranks. We've had teachers, politicians, doctors, lawyers. We even had an Olympic gold medal, medalist pole vaulter in Don Bragg in the 1960 Olympics. Uh, we've had many, many talented musicians, including Tim Hauser, who was one of the founding members of the Manhattan Transfer. But the biggest and most recognizable one has to be Jim Croce. I don't think that there is a singer, young or old, who by the end of their first rehearsal didn't know that Jim was a member of the group. The legend of Jim Croce has transcended through the generations of Villanova singers. The more stories that we hear about him, the more we know that he was our kind of guy. We could all imagine sitting around, having Jim tell some, tell some stories, sing a few songs, maybe having a beer or two, and singing some more songs. Um, I'd ask now if Ingrid could probably could take a couple of minutes to come up. Uh, we have a few things for her. I guess we'll wait till the till the crowds come by. <laughs> Actually, we can start off. Um, first, I'd like to present Ingrid with an official Villanova Singers golf shirt. Oh, great! The guys don't even have them yet. They'll be getting them tomorrow. Okay, so this is our first limited edition Villanova Singers golf is it shirt. Small? It's medium. <laughs> you can it's shrink nice it. You can shrink it. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. We had that big debate. I said small, but. <laughs> uh, okay, ne the next thing I would like to present is a DVD of a song that we've performed over the past Legacy Weekends concerts it's entitled Why We Sing. It, it holds great importance to us and it has many pictures of singers throughout the years, the, the 59 years of Villanova singers. Uh, the DVD contains pictures of Villanova singers from the past 59 years and it's a very symbolic song for us. Uh, I'd also like to present you with the DVD of Time in a Bottle, which is what was playing earlier. Thank you very much. That's very good. And, and this is, that was a tribute to the 50th anniversary of the Spires, which is last year. Excellent. Excellent. And uh, last but not least, um, this is something that's really near and dear to us as far as the Villanova Singers are concerned. Um, we'd like to present you with something that the Villanova Singers and Singers alumni, new guys, that are, are coming to our Legacy Event Weekends uh, have experienced and the new Villanova Singers on, in their freshman year, they receive a Villanova Singers Legacy pin, okay? Um, much, much like a fraternity, the singers are rich in tradition, ritual, and history, and the singers are an integral part of music, social, and cultural fiber of Villanova University. This pin is a symbol of our mission. The circular shape represents an unbroken link from the past, present, and the future. The color and inscription reminds us of our alma mater. The singer's seal at the center is our anchor to the brotherhood and song. And the inscription legacy is there to remind us of our past, our present, and our future of the Villanova singers. Ingrid, we're very proud to present this to you in Jim's memory. Thank you so much. Thank you for keeping Jim's legacy alive. And as long as the Villanova singers are at Villanova, his legacy will continue through the generations of Villanova singers to come. Thank you. Thank you. And now, it's my honor and privilege to reintroduce the Villanova Singers under the direction of Tim Evers. Save every day till eternity passes. 
Thank you so much for being here to uh, celebrate this very special occasion. Thank you again to the Spire, the Villanova Singers for a wonderful performance. Uh, please stay and have your book signed and join some refreshments. And thank you again for coming out this afternoon. Thank you.